Hello and welcome back to the Metchball Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today we got a bit something a bit special for you. This is hopefully the first of an ongoing series. Uh, in short, the the devs at Jinteki.net, um, I think a big shout out has to go to Lost Geek here, has implemented this replay system, which allows you to export games you play on Jinteki.net into JSON files, and then you can send them and uh, you can annotate them. There's a lot you can do with these, but basically you can go over some matches. We've done this a bit before on stream, uh, and I've asked people to send me some replays to go over. So we're going to go over a replay today that was sent in by Xwhistle. Specifically, this replay is uh, pretty fascinating because both of these players are relatively new to Netrunner and they're actually playing with a very limited card pool. Uh, it's system, what's it called? System Core 2019. So it's a small pool of cards, generally some pretty big staple cards that should represent the, the basis of a lot of these factions. But I want to get this video out right now. For what it's worth, the new player experience in Netrunner is going to be very different in just a couple weeks. Uh, if you've been, again, watching this channel or paying attention to Nisei.net, System Gateway, a new player experience, is going to be released at the end of this month. I'm so stoked uh, for it. It's, it's just coming out pretty soon at this point. And uh, that's going to be very different than what this looks like. So I wanted to get this out just ahead of that so you can see what it looked like at least a bit before. Now, that being said, if you're watching this at the point where System Gateway is already out, uh, I still think there's a lot you can learn from this video. This video should be targeting newer players, and I want to go over this to teach basic fundamentals on how to how to do some clean Netrunner play to figure out what your goals are, to, uh, to figure out some basic ideas of what you should be playing around uh, when it comes to these two identities. But I, I think a lot of that's going to carry over regardless if the card pool to some extent is still pretty different. So with that being said, uh, welcome. This is the, the replay that's sent over. I'm going to try and keep this simple. So if you're a newer player, uh, again, knowing the whole card pool helps you a heck of a lot when it comes to Netrunner, but obviously that's incredibly daunting. So I'm going to try and reduce this matchup into playing around one of two things uh, largely and see how the players deal with that and see how they might misstep and see the stuff that they do really well. That's largely it. Uh, we should be able to jump in right now. Apologies, I generally zoom in a bit more than this when playing JNet, but the replay system falls apart once you get around here. Actually, that's pretty good, so we can start here. Okay, so we're going to be able to see both players' hands here. So you see the runner at the top, the corp at the bottom. Shout out to Corin42. Uh, but of course, this is hidden information. We get to see everything. We're going to try and keep that in mind. Of, uh, again, that's private information. Now, let's start with the Corp here. The Corp is playing Haas Byroid and one of the simple, as they call it, system uh, core 2019 identity is Haas Byroid Stronger Together. It has a very simple ability. It just says all Byroid Ice has plus one strength. That's not really anything to play around. The Corp doesn't have to make any good decisions, but we can expect there to be Byroid Ice. On the other side of the table, we have Gabriel Santiago, our criminal who wants to run HQ, because the first time a turn that they do that, that is two credits. That's a lot of money. Um, so you generally, there's a lot of pressure on HQ in the early game. Now, how to play around these two identities? Uh, let's talk first about HB. And again, I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible. Uh, and let's start with the one main point that you can expect in Haas Byroid decks, and specifically this deck, and that's Byroid Ice. If you're not familiar with Byroid Ice, it looks like this. This is a good example of a Byroid Ice. And Byroid Ice is a subtype of ice that generally have this clause at the beginning of, of the card. And this one says specifically, the runner may spend a click to break any subroutine on Eli 1.0. So um, basically, Byroid Ice is generally cheaper and higher strength and has more subroutines than normal ice. It's a really good value proposition for the corporation but they allow the runner to be able to click through the subroutines, spend clicks during runs to be able to break the subroutines. So even without any breakers, the runner can generally run through this if they want to spend their time. And again, your time is pretty valuable, so it's not, it's something you still need to consider uh, when encountering this sort of ice, but it's a really big deal. And that's my first point when playing against HB. This HB is you have to expect there to be Byroid Ice. And while Eli 1.0 just ends the run, there's a fair bit, if I hit and show the deck, there's a fair bit of ice that actually is really scary. It has really mean subroutines. But again, the balancing mechanism here with Byroids is that you can spend your clicks to be able to break those subroutines without needing a program. So for instance, you want to run first click or you want to run early in the turn if you're face checking which is the term a lot of players use for running into unres dice and just seeing what it is, uh, you want to have extra clicks left in the turn. So if you run into each 1.0 and you can't break it or you don't want to break it and you have programs you're worried about being trashed, as long as you have two clicks after or left in the turn, you can ensure that each 1.0 won't wipe your whole board or your all your programs and it'll be a really big swing. So again, 
You have to expect there to be Byroids in HB decks. One of the best things you can do is run early in the turn. Running last click can be very scary if you're not prepared. So again, HB Ice can be pretty good, but if you're running early in the turn, you can generally deal with most of the things they throw at you. So that's, that's one of the things we're going to keep in mind. And that's actually, I think, the biggest thing we're going to keep in mind here. The second thing we're going to keep in mind is the idea of fast advance. And uh, this is going to be smaller. This isn't going to show up every single turn like the Byroid kind of idea is. The runner has to keep in mind. But the idea is that HB has access to this one card called Biotic Labor. And it might be unassuming. It says spend four credits and a click to play the operation and you gain two clicks. And why that's a really strong idea on a card is that it lets you fast advance and basically score agendas on the turn that you install them. So the idea is if you play Biotic Labor, you don't have three actions a turn, you have four actions. So you can install Project Vitruvius and then spend your next three actions, advance, 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 and score. And that's really, really strong. It's two points and allows you to get around the basic conceit that in Netrunner, you have to put your agendas on the table and protect them or bluff that they're traps and then next turn score them. And that can be a really big deal. If this corp can get to five points and the corp has Biotic Labor in hand and they draw into a Project Vitruvius, they can score that that those last two points to go to seven without having much interaction from Gabriel Santiago at all. And how do you play around that? It's pretty difficult. Um, as criminal, you have not too much in faction, but if you can put pressure on the corporation to ensure that they're never too comfortable and they have the money, because again, this play, Biotic Labor, Advance, 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 will cost you seven credits. That's pretty expensive. If you can keep pressure on them so they don't have too much, they don't have a lot of credits and they're not comfortable, you can make this a much more difficult line of play. Another thing, again, is you can put pressure on central servers. Again, if they're going to Biotic Labor out an agenda, that agenda might be in HQ for a couple turns while they're getting their money together or waiting for their Biotic Labor. So central pressure is also really important. So let's keep this down to those two things. Firstly, uh, Byroid Ice can be really mean, but if you run early in the turn, here's another example, Heimdall 1.0, none of the bad subroutines will, will connect with you if you want to spend those clicks. So run early if you are going to face check into some ice. Second thing, they can fast advance out. So if they're on five points, if they have a lot of money, they can start scoring agendas from hand. Now, this is actually a really weird thing that I didn't notice. Let me move my face really quickly. I probably should have done that before, is that Maybe you don't notice this, but these decks that the players put together, they are actually entirely neutral decks. I, I didn't realize this, but um, when they're playing system update, it looks like they just took all the HB cards and all the neutral cards and made a legal deck. But one of the big things about Netrunner is that you have influence, and that's the number in the bottom left corner of this identity. It has 15, which means you can take cards from out of faction up to 15 influence worth of cards and put them in your deck. And if you're not familiar, influence is those, those little dots on the bottom of the cards or the side of cards. So this card would be two influence if you put it into a deck that isn't a Haas Byroid deck. So this is only HB and this is only neutral cards. I think it's the same for the criminal. We'll see that in a second. And that's generally something you, you generally want to spend most, if not all your influence, because each faction is generally very good at certain things, but not amazing at all other things. And this allows you to, to fix some of the issues that you might have in your deck. Uh, so we're both working on no influence, which is going to limit what we do. Maybe it'll accentuate the strengths, but we'll definitely have some weaknesses. But generally, everybody who plays this will play 15 influence in their decks. It's worth noting that Devetus did post System Core 2019 decks. You can find these on NetrunnerDB. I should post the links. But these are cool starter decks in the System Core environment that do actually use the 15 influence on both the Haas Byroid deck and on the Criminal deck. So this might be a better deck, but we'll see how this works out. OK, so Criminal, uh, sorry, HB, we have Byroids and we have a bit of fast advance. Cool. Now let's talk about Criminal. And Criminal, there's honestly not too much to play around entirely. And that's because the system update format is a bit different than maybe the Criminals that you'll see every day in standard format, which is a wider card pool. Now, the first thing you need to play around is Gabriel Santiago's ability, which is pretty strong. Running HQ and gaining two credits on top of anything else you're doing on running HQ, usually accessing a card, that's a lot of money. That is a fair bit of money. So you need to make sure HQ is hard to run, a bit difficult to run. First thing you want to do, prioritize, is icing up HQ, icing up your headquarters so criminal, this criminal can't just smash in and gain two credits. Now, one card that's also really important to play around is Sneak Door Beta, which you have to assume is a two or three of in this deck. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to swap to the runner view. So now the runner's on the bottom, just so we can show the deck. And you'll notice 
that we're going to be playing two or three of these cards, Sneak Door Beta, which is a card that lets you make a run on archives and successful, if successful, treat that as a run on HQ. So that's a really big deal because once HQ is uh, successfully protected or well protected, you want to also worry about archives and empty archives with no ice on it, uh, unprotected archives, excuse me, can be a liability when the criminal starts getting into HQ in an easier way. And I think we have two of these in the deck. You also notice again, same thing, no influence spent here. It's just criminal and neutral, which is going to be a problem. Uh, one of the main problems we'll see with this deck is it doesn't have something uh, that we would like to call in Netrunner multi-axis, but basically cards that allow you when you're running R&D or HQ to see a lot more cards to give you a higher chance of finding agendas, putting pressure on central servers is how a lot of people would say that. We don't have a lot of cards like that. I think the only thing we have is maybe an HQ interface and legwork. So if we're running R&D, we're only going to see a single card, which is not the best. We could definitely spend influence to iron that out. Now, otherwise, when it comes to criminals as a whole, a lot of criminal decks are going to be making a lot of runs and getting a lot of value from the run. And you'll see a lot of cards like that, cards like John Masanori, cards like, uh, do we have security testing? I don't think we do. But cards like Dirty Laundry are good, cards like Paragon. Basically, cheap runs are really good for criminals. They can get a lot of value from them. So when you're playing against criminal, you generally want to ice up a bit of everything to make sure there's no server that they can get in without spending any money because they get a lot of benefit from making successful runs. I think the only other card I really want to highlight in this list is Bank Job which isn't a very common card in the standard format, but specifically in this sort of limited format, this card allows the criminal to run a remote server and make seven credits of profit. So it's actually generally a pretty bad idea to build or put assets into remote servers and not ice them up because you're going to give the criminal a heck of a lot of value. Um, as soon as you put a piece of ice in front of that and then they have to figure out how to deal with that ice, it, it slows them down a lot. But that's the only other thing I'm going to highlight here. What, what strikes me as surprising is that in this system, uh, core 2019, there's not that many strong HQ pressure run cards. And that's a lot of big thing that criminals do. Back in the day, cards like Account Siphon were really strong. It gives criminals a really, really good reason to run HQ and have a huge swing. The card we have right now that does that is Diversion of Funds. But cards like this don't exist in this deck list. So uh, it, this, this is going to be interesting because there's not too much pressure they can put on, but they have a lot of ways of it, sneaking around ice, which is a very criminal thing. Cards like Inside Job are actually probably worth playing around and understanding. Maybe that's a better card to highlight than Bank Job. The idea is that scoring behind a single piece of ice can be a liability because a criminal can simply Inside Job, not requiring any breakers, and get through one, even sometimes two pieces of ice. So that's where we are. Criminal, our criminal deck, again, it is going to be, it's going to want to run HQ. Definitely because of our ability. So you want to expect also sneak door beta. Prepare for that at some point in the game once that shows up. And then on top of that, let's play around bank job a wee bit if we can. And play around inside job. Everything else, we'll see that when it shows up. Let's go back to the spectator view. Again, just to go over on the on the corpse side, we have byroids. So if the runner wants to run, run early to make sure there's no surprises. And make sure that you're making the corpse spend money so they can't just biotic labor out to a victory at some point. All right. Let's dive in. So the Corporal Mulligan first, this is our opening hand. You have three pieces of ice is pretty good. You don't have any money inherently. You have an agenda and you have a trap card. Uh, there's not that many traps in, well, that's not true. This deck has one trap card. Uh, it's basically something that looks like an advanced agenda, but isn't. This card isn't too valuable in the early game because of trashish programs. I'm pretty sure a corporation's gonna mulligan here. They don't have to, but maybe they want a hedge fund or something to give them money. On the runner side, we have some card draw, which is nice. We don't have a lot of money. This deck probably has Sure Gamble and Easy Mark, Dirty Laundry, ways to get some good burst money to set up. Uh, and they have Breakers, which are okay, but they're pretty expensive. You could consider mulliganing this, but Caddy Jones really seems okay sometimes. So let's see how this works. Looks like our Corp took a mulligan, ending up with two pieces of ice and a Maryland campaign and Acid gives some money. Probably feeling pretty good about that, and it looks like our runner is going to keep their hand. And so the corp starts with a draw and goes from here. So again, one of the things we talked about playing against Criminal is that we want to make sure HQ is difficult to get into. And we have a couple ice to do that with. We have Turing, 
which is uh, pretty good ice specifically on a remote server. So I'd actually consider putting this on a remote server. We have a wall of static, which uh, is pretty good too. And we have an Ichi 1.0, which is not a good ice in the really early game because it doesn't end the run. Trashing programs doesn't matter if the runner doesn't have any programs. And trace one isn't a very big trace. The runner generally can pay one credit. So we definitely want to stop the, the the criminal from getting into HQ. So we definitely want to put something on HQ. I assume the best choice here is Wall of Static because it actually does end the run. Uh, and you generally put your Turing on the remote server to some extent. So we'll see how we go here. We're going to put the Maryland campaign out early. I like this. It gets a rolling. We're going to ice it up. Putting the Wall of Static here instead of the Turing. I think the Turing here is generally a lot stronger on the remote server. So you want to go that way. And we're going to put an ice on HQ. And this is the Ichi 1.0. Okay, so this is actually a big liability here because this looks like HQ is defended, but the runner could run through this and this ice won't do a lot. You could run through this and even click for the trace or pay into the trace if you want to, but the trash program subroutines on this do nothing. So let's see what the runner is going to take advantage of this. First click, we're running R&D. Okay, so this is my favorite first click, always with Gabriel Santiago is, almost regardless of what you're doing, is always run HQ first click. One of the best things you can do, and specifically because we're playing against HB, is if we want to run into ice, face check into ice, you want to do it early into the turn, you want to run HQ right here. Because now you're forcing the corp to spend money to res a piece of ice. And if it's really bad as a biroid, you can always click through subroutines. But this ice here, the placement, I think you'd, you'd want uh, this somewhere else. Because this doesn't do anything on turn one besides that one trace subroutine, which isn't particularly strong. So you would put the corp in an awkward situation where they probably don't res this. Because if they do res this, they go down to zero credits. And you could get into HQ, find out a bit about their hand, but most importantly, gain two credits which is a lot of money. That's a heck of a lot of money. So I really do like that play. We're checking R&D instead. Uh, so we'll see a card off the top. I don't know if this is going to tell us what the card is. Unseen card, no. And then second click, we're going for a special order to find a program. And let's see what happens here. And it looks like we're going for a Damara, which is a fracture, so it can deal with barriers. And then we only have four credits. We're going to install the Earthrise Hotel and click for a credit. OK, so let's talk about this. We have the ability here to run HQ to force the corp to spend money and gain two credits. Forcing your opponent to spend money is one of the best things you can do. And one of the things that I didn't notice with a lot of newer players to the game is they're pretty averse into running into ice because they're scared of it, right? Like this could be really, really mean. Now, again, with HB, a lot of times it is Byro Dice, and if you run early, there's very little threat associated with it. The other sort of ice you might want to watch out for in HB trashes programs, but again, we don't have any programs installed. So I do love the idea of always making the corp spend some ice. You always want to make or spend some money by resing ice. You always want to make the corp uncomfortable and make them, uh, you want to make it difficult for them to do the thing that they want to do by making them spend money. So I do love the HQ check here. Now, there's two other things that happened here. Special order was played. And when you play special order, you reveal the program that you're pulling and you add it to your hand. And that information is actually super valuable to the corp. The corp now understands that the runner has a fractor in their hand. They also understand that they can't play the fractor because it costs four. But that information is a really big deal because now Coron on their following turns can make some educated decisions about like understanding what the runner is capable of. Playing special order and then just keeping the card in hand can be really awkward. There's also a chance that you draw into this program just by the Earthrise Hotel, so you don't need to do that this turn anyways and spend the card and the credit. But basically doing this for uh, preemptively gives the corp so much information on what you're capable of and the cards in your hand. And that's something you want to avoid doing. Again, for uh, the corp installs all the cards face down, so information does seem very important for them. For the runner, it's really important too. So showing the corp what you have in hand when you don't need to, especially also pulling this card when you don't need it. We can't even afford it, mind you. Uh, it's probably not a thing you want to do. Now, the last thing here is they played Earthrise Hotel, which is a fantastic card, giving you six uh, draw for four credits. And again, only one click is really good. But the issue here that Exosol might be running into is that they don't have the money to sustain this. Once they draw into two cards next turn, uh, I don't know what they can afford to play. They're going to have to get really lucky here and draw into something like an easy mark or a dirty laundry, basically a card that will give them money while they don't have a lot of money. Because if we draw into two expensive cards, we're so far away from playing them. So Earthrise Hotel, you know, is a card maybe you want to wait for a couple turns to get ready, but you want to establish your economy. This is a really big deal. Um, 
when it comes to Netrunner, you looking at your opponent, you can kind of tell what they're capable of doing. And Exasol next turn isn't going to be capable of doing a lot. They're going to have six cards in hand, but they only have one credit. We know one of their cards is a program they can't afford. And so if Koran really wanted to aggressively jam an agenda, they might be able to get away with it, barring certain cards like Inside Job. So putting yourself in a situation where you don't have a lot uh, that you're like you're clearly building for two or three turns down the line. Maybe the corp can capitalize on it because Exosol doesn't look like they're capable of that much for the next one or two turns when they're only at one credit. That being said, taking this time off and building up is going to be good three, four turns from now. And Koran doesn't look like they're doing anything too fast based on what we know about their hand. Maybe the runner, what they saw on the top of the deck, gives them some more information. So, oh, actually, that's actually really important. It looks like they saw the wall of static and then that's why they drew the Damara. But again, I don't think you have to prepare for this. You want to just run into this, force the corp to spend three to res it, and then later find out, you know, pull your fractor in response to that. Because now Koran knows that if they install the wall of static, eventually it might not be too good. So information is really important. Anywho, we res the Maryland. That's going to be taken away. We're going to install into a new remote server. There's the Turing. So the Turing is going to look, it looks like that's going to be their scoring server. And again, Turing is five strength on a remote. Also worth noting that Turing does kind of work like a Byroid. If you run into this on your first click, you can actually spend your next three clicks just to get through it, which honestly, that it can be a really, really big deal. We're going to install the Ash behind here and last click draw a card. Okay. so. This is a really, really big deal in Netrunner. And if you can sort this sort of thing out, it's going to have a, like a very, very, very significant uh, impact on how many games you're winning in Netrunner. And we say this all the time on the channel, plan your turn. So knowing here, Koran knows what they're going to do on their turn. They think they're going to install the wall, uh, the, sorry, the Turing and install the Ash. Okay, so one, two. And then the last click, they might not have planned this far ahead and they didn't know what they were going to do here. So then they draw last click. Now, why that's bad? is because uh, you could have drawn something better here. Maybe instead of the Ash, if they drew first action, they might have drawn a better ice for the remote server. Maybe they drew another Maryland that they could install here and then get value from it or an Adonis campaign. Basically, you want to give yourself as many options as you can before you commit to making plays, because now we committed to something, committed to something, and then gave ourselves another option. Now, it's not really a punish here because it's biotic labor. They probably wouldn't have played in that Prior, prior turn, but it could have seen that this Ash was actually a Maryland campaign or a Donis campaign, which would be better for Koran this turn. All right, let's go off to runner drawing two, and there you go. We drew into Hostage, and again, a very expensive card. There were a couple turns from playing away. So at this point, Exosol has no income coming in, barring maybe the bank job, and I think the bank job is a pretty reasonable line of play here. Uh, so they probably need to get their money up, because again, all these cards in their hand are dead. We're running R&D, going for a single axis here. OK, there's not a lot they can afford to trash. They're basically just hoping it's an agenda. And the chance of that, it's worth knowing on like offhand, the chance of an agenda showing up is generally about one in five cards. So a 20 percent chance of this being OK. Uh, let's see if they hit anything here. Uh, actually getting Vitruvius off the top. OK, now this is a bit. This is obviously a really big deal. The runner's probably going to need about three agendas to win this game. They already have one, which is huge. Uh, but Admittedly, that's lucky. Sometimes you need to take those chances, but at this point, I think you'd want to set up a bit because you're in a really awkward spot where you're going to be drawing a lot of cards and not going to be able to play them. We're running back. Let's see. I don't think it's going to tell us what we get here. And just clicking for a credit and installing a Caddy Jones. Okay, so again, we're in the exact same situation. This is two turns in which we could have ran HQ and could have got two credits. So right now we could have had so much more money and we would also force the corp to spend money, which can be a really big deal here. On average, we're expecting the corp to spend, I don't know, two to four credits resing their ice. And that puts them on a lot less credits where now you can maybe even check server two if you wanted to. Maybe it lets you put the bank job down and run here because that's a really good turn, right? Like run here. If they res, which they shouldn't, uh, you get two credits and an axis. You get some information. Then you have the money to play bank job and then maybe run server two. You need to threaten the corp because right now the corp is doing everything they want. This could have been an Adonis. This could be a Maryland that's ticking away. And we're not forcing them to spend money. It's so important to force your opponent to spend money because otherwise they're going to do whatever the heck they want to do. Now, Caddy comes down last click. Uh, Caddy is a really interesting card when it comes to like learning Netrunner, because how to use her efficiently, uh, a lot, it's, she's very easy to use inefficiently. Um, I think this is a good example of maybe not the best way to use Caddy. You can only use Caddy once a turn, so you generally want to use Caddy every turn. But because we installed her last click, uh, we are not going to be able to use her. So the as she's only going to pay off now in at 
two to three turns from now as opposed to in theory like she could she could pay off a turn sooner is what i'm trying to say another issue that we have here is we're ending our turn on zero credits which is again a really big deal for koran if they top deck an agenda they might be able to jam into the remote and there's very little exa can do about this right because we know they have no money on top of that they're going to be drawing two cards and probably won't be able to install any of them we're going to see a couple clicks for credits for sure top deck we have a pad campaign all right let's see we do install pad campaign on top of the ash Install on R&D to stop the single axes, which honestly, the single axes, you might be okay with exit getting them because if they're going for singles, they're not setting up. And then last click draw. So exact same thing here where last click draw could be an issue that maybe you wanted to get the victor on R&D instead of the wall of static. And maybe you do because this is a nicer face check. Sure, the runner could click through it, but sometimes they run into this and take the brain damage. Uh, so again, drawing last click, you want to plan your turn to make sure that you're giving yourself as many options as possible. This is also an interesting thing, the pad campaign on top of the ash. Uh, it looked like this server was going to be the server in which Koran was going to be scoring out agendas because ash is a really strong card at protecting agendas in the remote server. Now we have a pad campaign on top of it, which you could res, let it trigger for a couple turns and then destroy it or over install on top of it with an agenda when that comes in. Um, but the pad is going to be on here for a while. Let's see if this gets over installed at some point. Now, that being said, I, I do like the part of the play where Koran doesn't just put the pad campaign into a new remote server because, again, bank job is just going to be everything Exosol needs. Clicks for a credit, installs bank job, runs this naked asset that they could have put out here, and then suddenly they're on, what, eight credits, uh, which is, you know, exactly what Exa needs at this point, considering they're on zero. So the pad campaign in here is okay for now. It's definitely better than the remote server if we're going to play around bank job. All right, runner draw two more cards, and again, they can't play any of these. So again, we talked about cards you can play on low money, and one of the best cases is Dirty Laundry or Easy Mark. So we're going to go for credit, credit, and then pro play the Dirty Laundry, just running archives, I reckon, and just to gain three. So now we're at five. So Exit can now threaten to install things, and for a click, we're going to put money on Caddy. I love that. What I don't like still, this is the third turn where we could have got two credits for free by just running HQ. Maybe you have to spend a click to go through the trace. Maybe you spend one credit, but and Koran would be forced to consider spending five or not rising this, which is also really good information. So again, if you have an ability, you try to want to capitalize. You want to try to capitalize on, and this is such a strong ability to put pressure on. You're going to discard a card here, getting rid of a breaker, which is uh, surprising. I don't know what hostages gets in this deck. Maybe it's valuable, but throwing out a breaker is, is, is interesting, especially for this breaker, which has a good ability, even if you just trash it sometimes. All right, corpse side, we're going to pre-res the pad campaign. This is a really big deal. Some Netrunner players, newer players don't realize this, but you can res this right before your turn starts, and then it'll be res and you gain the credit. You don't have to res this on your turn when you install it. So we're going to get a credit from that. The Maryland's almost done, and we drew into a cheap ice hunter, which is nice. Gives a tag, and let's see what we do here. We're going to draw once. That's good. Draw two, that's good. Again, drawing early in the turn is what you want to do. And we drew into an IPO perfectly. We're probably going to play that as our terminal last action to gain up to 13 credits. And again, this is such a clear example of why forcing the corp to spend money is so important. Just like that awkward situation where Exo was in for the last two or three turns, well, while you don't have money, it's tricky to do anything. And if we force to res here, even if you just face, face plant into this on R&D and they consider paying three credits for it, they're further away from those eight credits they need for the IPO. Now Koran is really comfortable. They can probably afford to res every single ice on the board, give or take, uh, and their money is coming in. They have the pad, they have the Maryland, and Exa had the chance for the last couple turns to really put that pressure on and force them to res. Again, the corp doesn't have money. There's very few things they can do besides click for credits. So um, keeping the pressure on is really important. All right. Last two cards. We're getting off of that Earthrise Hotel. We have an inside job, which uh, it's really interesting to see how players play this. This is a very strong card for contesting remote servers that you think have agendas in them. Sometimes people put them on central pressure, uh, use this on central pressure. Let's see where we go from here. We also do have the sneaker beta, which is a really big deal. You can drop this for four credits and then start running HQ through the sneak door, gaining you two credits from Gabe. So that it makes this a lot cheaper. And then it puts pressure on Koran to, uh, to ice up archives. Now, that's a good line of play. I like doing that after you force them to spend some ice uh, money resing ice on HQ. So we'll see how this goes. And we're going to drop down the sneak door beta. Okay, let's see. We're going to make a run with the sneak door beta, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I think this is a goof, right? Yeah, that actually might be just a misplay because they wanted to make a run on archives. I'm assuming they they wanted to click on the sneak door beta instead. So let's see if they undo that. Yeah, they're going to undo that, of course. 
that didn't work. Okay, you wanna click on the sneak door beta on gentechy.net to use it. And now you'll be able to run HQ. And this is the first time we used Gabe's ability and we could have used Gabe's ability, I think, for the last three turns. That's six credits, that's a lot. Uh, lol. And they accessing from HQ firing Gabe. And we now know there's a victor in hand. I think that the only two cards that we've seen so far are the agenda, the victor, and the wall of static. Okay. Now, Cronin can easily put an ice here on archives. Uh, let's keep going. And then we're going to install bank job last click and hit up caddy. So installing bank job from hand, like it's nice to get it out of your hand. I suppose they were going to have to discard a card here. Oh yeah. They had two abing nails. That's why they threw it out. Excuse me. Um, but putting down bank job, honestly, uh, I don't like it. I, I I don't love that play because it gives up a lot of information here. You're basically telling the corp, if you put a naked asset out there, I'm going to dunk on you with money. And we we're they honestly could have done that. They could have considered, like, if they draw into another uh, Maryland or into a pad campaign, they might actually end up putting it uniced. But now they're definitely not going to. So we'll see if this plays out. But this is the sort of card I love keeping in hand because if their corp plays around it poorly, they're going to, it's a huge credit swing. But now they really shouldn't play around this poorly because they know you have it. Um, another thing I was going to say, I forget what it was. We'll see, see if that catches up. Hitting caddy, that's good too. You want to do that. All right, Maryland campaign finishes. I reckon that's going to be shuffled back into the deck. Uh, so we're drawing in a road to turret. Yeah, this is what I want to say. So one of the big things about... Um, one of the only ways that HB Ice really punishes you in this format is trashing programs. Like there's some things that do brain damage, but trashing programs is a really big deal. Hitting a road to turret when you have nothing installed, they just pay four credits to end the run, which is pretty good. But now as soon as you have something installed, like a sneak door beta, let alone even a program, uh, that's really rough. So now that the sneak door beta is installed, the Ichi actually has some teeth. Before it was a largely a pretty bad res, five credits for a trace one tag and brain damage. That's not very good. But now that this is down, you actually have to care about some of these subroutines or just let this get trashed, which is probably the right play in, in a lot of cases. Road to is another good reason. And that's why I love when playing against HB is to put pressure on when you don't have any programs specifically in this format, because none of this ice really hurts you. Wall of static, fine. They pay three credits. This, fine. It does very little. This, fine. This, fine. Like you can crash into any of these without any sort of punishment. Now that you have a program down, the ice gets a bit scarier, but that's why I love putting pressure on. You have to hit the corp and make them spend money. All right, so it looks like we're gonna get two installs here. So we're gonna put the road turret on archives. That looks like it's gonna end up connecting with the sneak door beta soon enough. We're gonna put the aggressive secretary into a remote and we're going to archive memories and pull a card from archives into HQ. And we're gonna end up pulling the IPO to, to, to deck. Okay, so this is interesting. Aggressive Secretary is a, one of the few cards we have in our deck that we can advance that looks like an agenda, but that isn't an agenda. So firstly, right now, it's okay. It, like Trashing programs is really good when you're trashing Icebreakers because the runner only has so many of them. Trashing Sneak Door is, is all right, but it looks like Sneak Door will probably get trashed by the Road Turret eventually. This is the sort of card you generally want to get down and put advancements on it and then hope the runner runs it. This might not be the best time to play that, considering it doesn't look like the runner can deal with ice, barring maybe inside job, but uh, it has no advancements on it. So let's we'll see if the corp advances the next turn. Another thing to talk about is Archive Memories, and Archive Memories is an incredibly powerful card uh, in the HP card pool. It lets you recur things, which is not something you can inherently do in the game, and there's some really strong cards that you can consider recurring. Uh, right now, we just played aggressive, uh, uh, sorry, we call archive memories. We played that to get back an IPO. And if you look at it, you're spending two clicks to gain five credits. That's not bad. It really isn't that bad. Uh, that's a, a, a reasonable bit than just click better than clicking for credits, but it's not too much better than just clicking for credits because the corp could have just clicked for one credit, click for another credit. Instead, we're spending, you know, uh, this resource to get three more credits on that sort of play, which, you know, it doesn't sound amazing, but it's definitely something you can do in a pinch. Now, why I think this card has more value is that there's some really strong cards in the deck. We talked about Biotic Labor that lets you score agendas from hand, and the ability to pull back a Biotic Labor with Archive Memories can be incredibly powerful, uh, especially when Koran's Econ seems to be going pretty well. So we'll see if that, that, that comes back to, to bite them, but generally playing Archive Memories to get Economy back is not as useful as playing it to get these sort of cards that will cause you to win the game more precisely than just having a bit more money. There's a lot of money cards in the in the deck, but there's not too many of these. Another good candidate is Ash, which is a really strong way of defending a remote server. And once Ash gets trashed, bringing back Ash, that can be pretty, pretty strong as well, especially if the runner just spent a lot of money bringing it down the first time. We'll see how that goes. All right, runner starts. 
two credits only to their name, so there's not a lot they can do here. They're going to take six off of Caddy. We'll talk about that in a second. Then they play a breaker, and now they're running. All right, so they're not running first click. They only have one click left, which is a really big deal if this turns out to be a Byroid. And like we've been saying the whole game, running early against Byroids is so strong because if this ice here was an Ichi, it's really, really bad for them. Uh, that Trace will probably connect. They might be able to, they probably would spend a click to protect one of their programs, uh, but uh, it, it can be really, really, really rough for them. On top of that, if this is a Roto turret, that's really bad for them as well. But this is what I'm saying, where running without programs generally is the safest thing against a lot of HP decks because there's not a lot of things they can punish you with. But they did just put a program down, and uh, we'll see how this lines up. All right. Ooh, oh, sorry, I went too far there. So it looks like we're going to connect. It is going to be the wall of static, which is the four first money that the corp has had to spend to, to deal with the runner, which, again, every turn I think you could force the corp to res a piece of ice here. Uh, they're going to have to pay four credits to get through this, which is a fair bit, and now it puts Exosol back down on zero credits, uh, barring maybe using the bank job here. But again, yeah, I don't know. They end up spending eight credits just to get in to get the eight off the bank job. We're going to access here and we're not going to use the bank job. We're actually going to see the card in his aggressive secretary. So I think uh, Exosol was really hoping that this was an agenda. Right now we're accessing with zero credits, which means if this was a Maryland campaign, if this was an Adonis campaign, you couldn't actually trash it. Luckily, this card doesn't do anything because it's not advanced. And this is what I was talking about. Imagine Koran before advanced this card, which is generally what you want to do with these sort of advanceable traps. They could have just gone ahead and trashed the Damara. And now Exosol is really far behind. Spending eight credits just to go in to get one of their programs trashed is incredibly powerful. Um, but it looks like we're just going to trash that aggressive secretary for zero, which is really good for Exosol, I suppose. Not that you're going to ever have to run this again if it gets advanced. And now we're going to run HQ. And this is, oh, this is such a perfect example where if you're going to face check, if you're going to run into uh, unknown HB ice, one of the best times you can do it is first click. Because this is the exact beautiful situation where this is rezzed easily for five. And Exosol can't deal with any of these clicks. So not only do they have no money, but they're going to trash both of these programs and they're going to take a tag and a brain damage. I'm really excited to see where this tag, if the tag is used by Koran, but this is going to be disgusting. So out in all caps is super accurate. Sneak their beta gone, Demara gone, and then the trace is going to go through. Losing the inside job from hand, that was probably the best card in hand too, which is unfortunate. But at least we still do get it go get to get in and gain an access and two credits. So, okay. Now, also, that's last click. They have a tag, so Koran can now spend two credits to trash one of these cards. Uh, it might be worth trashing the bank job. Uh, the caddy is really awkward. Mm, it actually might be worth trashing, too, because Koran's doing all right here. It's going to make the IPO a bit harder to play. But this is so avoidable, right? Again, first thing I think we should have done, first click of the game, is run into this, get the information, understand here. But if you're face checking into HB Ice, you can't do it on the last click, because there's some really bad stuff that can hit you. This is a prime example. And again, this is so bad if you run first click. Well, well, now the cool thing, honestly, the cool thing right now is that this does very little. That now Exosol knows first click ne their next turn, they can just run through this if there's not a second piece of ice here. So that at least is going well for them. All right, so the Corp just top decked an the agenda. They're in a pretty good space to draw, uh, to, to jam this out if they really want to. It might make it harder for the IPO to get played. I think you can do both. Um, we know that they just lost an inside job, which is one of the criminal's best ways of contesting remotes without having any sort of programs installed. They also only have two credits and they have a tag. There's a lot of options here Koran can do. I'm excited to see what this is. So first, they're gonna double ice the remote server. Second, they're going to install the Vitruvius. And then third click, let's see whether they go for an advancement on this or they go for the IPO. And it looks like they're just going to go ahead and trash the bank job, putting themselves on six credits. So Victor into wall static is pretty good. Now, again, if you run this early, you could click through the Victor. Um, but the wall static is going to demand a breaker. And the Vitruvius is safer here than an HQ, which I like. Because, again, the runner can always run through this EG. Okay, Exo still has a tag. Let's see if they end up clearing it. They're actually going to clear the tag here, which honestly, I don't think you need to do. There is certain cards uh, that are tag punishment cards. HB, has Byraid has in faction, I don't think any tag punishment cards. That generally comes in other factions I have to watch out for. And the worst that a Chroma Koran can do here is destroy the Caddy Jones. Now again, Exa has been spending a lot of the game underneath five credits, which really limits the amount of things that Koran has to play around. They're not worried to programs coming down. They're not worried of them getting more money because most money cards cost you money to play. We'll see how this goes. First click, or sorry, second click, drawing into John Masanori. 
uh, a good tempo-based run card, another click to draw into Fairy, and then we have a click just to put stuff on Caddy. So if they cleared the tag, they generally want to use Caddy, but they're in a pretty bad position here, I think. Pad campaign still ticking along, which is nice. They have to discard a card because their hand size is four. And beginning of the turn, we drew into a successful field test. So now the agendas are they're piling up. Now XSL again, we talked about this, can just smash into HQ here. They could run, they can spend one click, to uh, two clicks to gain an access and two credits, which might have been pretty good if you uh, want to just click through that trace. And that's, that's, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> it gets you an access, which is better than clicking for credits, I suppose. And let's see what happens. We're spending an advancement here on the Vitruvius. We're advancing the Vitruvius again, and we're advancing the Vitruvius again. Are we scoring it? And we're scoring it. Okay, so. Two points to both players. Koron is now on the board for points. Project Vitruvius is one of the strongest agendas in the game, but it only becomes strong once you over advance it. You notice the text, you get an agenda counter when you add another advancement over or for each advancement over the three required for this. And Koron was actually in a position where they could consider just like advancing this once and then maybe putting another ice on HQ to, to protect from the Gabriel Santiago pressure. Something like that might've been okay. Getting an advancement on this is so powerful because it lets them pull back at Instant speed without spending a click allows you to pull back cards like Biotic Labor. And again, we're talking about Biotic Labor being one of the strongest cards in this deck because now you can play Biotic Labor, pull back the Biotic Labor, play that same Biotic Labor again, and even score like a 4-2 out of hand without leaving it on the table. Now, looks like leaving agendas on the table right now isn't too hard of a thing, but getting a counter on this is generally, it's generally worth it. And it looked pretty safe behind two pieces of ice when Exosol has nothing to show for the board state besides a Caddy Jones with three credits on her. All right, the runner going to draw up. I don't know what they're drawing into, looking to draw into right now. I think it would have to be an easy mark, but this is one of the situations where if you don't have money in the game, there's not much you can do. So Exosol might have been just better off just clicking for credits here, just so that at some point they have enough credits to threaten things. They can threaten, oh, maybe I have another inside job. Maybe I can put down a breaker like Abignail and use its trash ability to bypass. But when they're on zero credits, there's very little threat. We're drawing in again. It's into another John Masanori. We're going to install the fairy. This is a nice card. It lets you hit into things like the, the Ichi or into the Rota turret and not have too much of a punishment. And then last click, Caddy Jones. Again, you could have ran HQ here. Uh, the runner could have run HQ here, spend a click, got two credits, and even had a chance of stealing an agenda. When HQ is open, Gabe can get a lot of value. You want to get in here. The runner has access to very few cards. Even like when they're on four credits here, just run, you can run R&D. First click, see if they res, I guess. Like if they res there, now the corp is on one credit and then they're in an uncomfortable spot. Uh, so putting pressure on is pretty good, but I think the biggest thing Exa right needs, needs to do right now is get themselves back into the game. The only way they're doing that right now is the slow drip of Caddy, which, you know, will be pretty good, but Koran has a window here. Their, their money though isn't good enough just yet. Throwing out the other John, fantastic. And uh, this pad campaign, definitely doing work. Admittedly, the Ash here, you definitely want that into the other server, considering that's where you're going to score agendas. Um, uh, we didn't mention it before, but there was a Maryland campaign in here, which is a, an, an asset that doesn't last forever. It might have just been fine to put the Ash on top of that Maryland campaign and then use this as your scoring server in a couple turns, uh, as opposed to this Ash being on the pad campaign is super awkward, because you generally don't want to raise the Ash to protect the pad campaign. All right, we draw into Enigma, which is great. It's an end to run ice that they can't click through, which is one of the weaknesses of Byroids. We're gonna do install. So we're getting that successful field test brewing. We're gonna go ahead and advance it, which is fantastic because next turn we're threading to score it out. And then last click draw. Again, not something you wanna do. You wanna plan your turn. If you knew that you were gonna install advance this, you might as well draw first to be like, oh, I got into a hedge fund and maybe I'll rather play the hedge fund than push for this play. Give yourself as many options as possible. Again, one of the biggest things you can do and so important is plan your turn. So uh, that gives you a, a, just a huge bump in win rate if you're always playing the best you can with the cards that you were going to have that turn. Okay, runner side. Gonna take six credits off of the Caddy Jones. Um, let's see how they use them. We're gonna go for a run here. No, excuse me. It looks like, yeah, we're going for a run and we're smashing to HQ. So Exosol has seen the line of play here. It looks like they're actually gonna ferry this though. Let's see. So they're hitting the Ichi and they're going to pay three for the fairy. So let's think about this, right? 
The subroutines on this didn't matter until you played the fairy, but now we're playing the fairy, so you actually have to break this. If you didn't have the fairy installed, you actually would get through this much easier, it would only be a single click, but now we install this and spend three credits. And again, that's a really big deal. When you don't have programs installed, very little of the face checks here in HB matter, a lot of them are trash programs, and a lot of them are attached to biroids. So as long as you're running early, you're totally fine. So now we're spending cards and credits just to deal with something that was easier to deal with before. It's good that they're putting pressure on, though. We got into HQ. Wait, what happened here? I think we, something goofed up. Let's see how this goes. Oops, didn't mean to jack out. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we're going to go back. And we're going to access a biotic labor from hands. We got Gabe money, which is good, even though we ended up spending more. But at least, I guess it makes it run cheaper. And we know that there's a biotic labor in hand. And this is a card that, once you know it's in hand, it's a really big deal. All right, now we're running here on R&D. And again, if this is a really scary biroid, this could be pretty bad for you. You have at least one click to click through a subroutine, but this, these can be pretty rude. Uh, let's see if we res that. So Kroren's not resing this wall static, assuming they want the money for the successful field test. Single access off of R&D. And we're trashing a pad campaign for four. So that is very, very expensive because Exosol, again, doesn't have credits. They're down to one. And they can't play any of the cards in their hand. And that's such a big deal. You need money to be able to generate more money. And having low credits, the core has to respect very little of what you're capable of because at the end of the day, you're not capable of, of a lot. I don't think you want to dr draw this uh, Trash's Pad campaign. There's a chance here that they're going to run back to see a new card. Oh, but they're actually just going server one. But they can't deal with the wall aesthetic. Why are they running this? They can't get through this. Okay, and now we hit a victor, which is again, a biroid. And if you run into this early, you can spend a click, but it looks like we're not gonna have that click. We have no clicks left. So this thing is going to do a brain damage. So let's fire that. It's gonna end the run and trash the second code gate breaker from hand. Uh, so there's two in the bin here. Not sure why the run here happened. The wall static you can't even get through. Uh, so there's actually even no reason to res this on the corpse side. And now the successful field test can't be scored. Also, now that the pad campaign was trashed, the runner could have considered trashing this and coming back. I don't love the play because, again, one credit means the corp can't, the runner can't do a lot. But now the corp is actually going to draw into a brand new card. So even having the information that, oh, they just drew a pad campaign, this could be anything. And hey, it's an IPO. So Koran can't score this out this turn. He could just probably click for credits. We're going to go for advance, advance, credit. Okay. So that's an interesting line of play. They're gonna to have to discard a card here. So advance, advance, credit here. It puts the corp on zero credits as well. Oh, actually, no, they have one more click. They're gonna click for credit. And that is the same sort of idea where the corp can't do a lot if the runner doesn't have, if they don't have a lot of money. So say Exosol had a strong R&D pressure card, maybe something like a Maker's Eye, which they could afford if they had one more credit, they click for a credit, play it. There's no chance of resing anything on R&D. Um, and that's a really big deal. The corp could also, the runner could also drop a bank job here and run, uh, pad the server and gain eight credits off the bank job. Putting yourself in a situation where you don't have any credits really limits what's your, what you're capable of doing. And I don't think you need to advance this, this turn. The corp could have just as well clicked for three credits and next turn scored this out. This is also a liability because if Exosol somehow can get into the server, the corp spent a lot of credits and a lot of time advancing this. And if the runner steals it, it's all for nothing. So it's a bit of a high risk play. You could have been considering advancing it once. So next turn you can do advance, advance, score, and still have a click to maybe install something into the server. They don't really have anything in their hand, but that's a nice line of play too. But install, advancing this twice over just puts you on low credits and allows you not to react. Because in theory, they could have like what, advanced, credit credit and then still res the wall of static or the maybe not the terrain i think they're one credit short throwing out the hunter okay that's actually a really cheap ice i like hunter a fair bit they're gonna struggle to deal with it and trace three goes through but yeah okay that's fair and we're off to actually maybe throwing out like okay so when you score this you get to install any cards from hq ignoring all costs so you actually might have wanted to keep the hunter in hand because you get to install it for free which is fantastic uh that actually installing three ice for free is a lot of value because most of your installs are going to cost you one or two credits and that actually might be more value from the ip than the ipo let alone we're many 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 credits away from scoring the ipo specifically also if we're going to commit to scoring this out next turn so i think throwing the ipo out here was probably right and then you install this for free all right Corp runners drawing and again i think you need to establish your credit pool first there are a couple good draws here i think easy mark is the best draw just to get you back in the game for economy but we have another card we can't play hitting up caddy 
drawing again, there's that easy mark, and we're probably gonna play a last click. Yeah, okay. And there's the same sort of thing. It wasn't a hard punish here, but if you wanna plan your turn, you wanna do it. So this is back at the top of the turn, right? So you hit caddy, sure, draw, sorry. It was more like draw, caddy, draw. I mean, you're in theory better off just to do draw, draw, and then see what happens, because hitting caddy changes nothing about the information you have. So you probably wanna do that last in a turn. Again, you could have ran R&D here for a single if you wanted to. This is, they decided instead to, to stabilize their position, which is pretty interesting, uh, which is probably right. Some turns they went for for um, aggressive single axes, which does pay off. Maybe you're, if you're in a bad position, you want to go for those because it gives you a chance of winning. Um, and then they're going to discard the hostage, which I think is right. You also could consider trashing the caddy. You already have one installed. Um, and we're off to the races. Advance. We did drew a nice, which is really nice. Uh, because we can install it for free. And now we're going to go ahead and score out successful field test, which lets you install all the cards from hand that you can for free. And this is always really interesting to see how this happens. So we're going to get the Enigma out there. What else we get? We get uh, Victor in front of that. That's good. And a new remote, Enigma out here. So a couple things. Firstly, what the Corp is doing really nicely here is that they're actually mixing up the kind of ice that they have on a server. It's really nice that they have a Code 8 into a barrier because now if the runner wants to get through this, barring always they can click through Victor 1.0, is that they need two programs. And that's really nice as opposed to stacking two barriers. Same thing here. I guess it's Code Gate into Code Gate into, into barrier, but it's nice. You generally want to mix it up a bit. Uh, they also did put an Enigma out here into another remote server, and I'd argue that this can a lot of times be a liability, and that's because we talked about playing around bank jobs so heavily this game, because if bank job can get to the access step, even if there's no cards to access, you can get any credits. So now if XSL puts down a bank job and runs server three, the corpus actually probably needs to end up resing this Enigma to deny the eight credits. So you don't want to put yourself in a situation where bank job can, can fire off. Again, bank job would be such a big deal for XSL if they fired it now. That's a, sh a lot of money. Now, Corrin does have two clicks left. They're just going to take two credits and they're going to keep their hand here. So they're on game point. They have three point agendas in their deck. So if they can get enough money and go install advance advance behind uh, two to three eyes, uh, Excess All is going to be out of the game. So they definitely have to, uh, to to put some pressure on here. Now, Corrin doesn't have a lot of money, which is pretty nice. All right, we're starting here. The runner smashing HQ, fantastic. Again, this is what should have been happening most every turn, especially from turn one. Ichi doesn't do anything. You could even, I don't think if you want to take the tag and brain damage at this point, you could probably spend a click to do it, but you get an access. Uh, you also probably know though, for what it's worth, that Koran doesn't have an agenda in hand because they scored successful field tests and it would actually let you install another agenda if you had it in hand into server one, right? Um, so it looks like there's probably no agendas in here, but you still can get in and get some value, I guess. I guess you're spending two clicks for an access and two credits. Eh, it's maybe not the best. All right, there you go. Clicking through the trace. Again, these other subroutines don't matter, and we're going to get an access here. It's an IPO, and you get two credits from Gabe. Again, I do like running first, dealing with the, with these biroids. I think running R&D might have been better here, just because if successful field test had an agenda, I have no doubt it would be in server one. So you probably just want to go R&D and force them to res some ice. Again, if they res either of these, they're on zero credits, which means they have very little things to do next turn besides click for credits. Putting money on Caddy Jones and installing Earthrise. This is good. They need the card draw. Uh, they can always take the money off Caddy so they can ins install anything they do draw, which is nice. But this is this is this is getting better for Exa for sure. Corp gets an Eli off the top of their deck. This pad campaign has done a lot of work, and we're gonna draw into a biotic labor. Drawing in again to Mason Bellamy and upgrade. Yeah, he's fine. And click for a credit there. Gonna throw out the biotic labor. Ooh, this is an interesting discard here. Uh, we generally want to score only one more agenda to win the game as the Corp. You want to score out a 5-3 agenda. And Double Biotic Labor is going to be very expensive, but it does give you some options. It looks like Koran really wants to get up to those 8 credit uh, ratio, the 8 credit threshold, which next turn they can, which is 6 credits with Pad Campaign, 7-8, click for credit, click for credit, IPO. And this is a really big deal. Is I think we accessed the IPO, right? We accessed the IPO last turn. So Exa knows the IPO is in hand, and Koran is perfectly at the situation where next turn they can play the IPO. You get one from Pad Campaign, credit, credit, IPO. So Exa really wants to put pressure onto the Corp to put them in an awkward situation where they can decide between either resing ice to defend some of their, their central servers in this situation or playing the IPO. So I'd really love to see some pressure from Exa here because that's what Koran is set up to do next turn. Okay, we got our last Abagnale. We also have a Fairy. 
Looks like we got a run and we're running HQ here. Now the Corp did draw a fair bit. This is actually a fundamental that hasn't come up so much and that's largely because X has been kind of struggling to, to maintain control of the board or to, to basically build up pressure by installing things and keeping their money up. But you have to think about one in every five cards in the Corp's deck is an agenda. Now the Corp did draw a couple cards last turn. So the chance of them drawing to an agenda is pretty high. Well, not pretty high, but it's it's more likely than the last turn they had an agenda in hand. But I would argue if the Corp had an agenda, they would probably install it into server one as opposed to clicking for credit for the last turn, barring maybe that IPO play we talked about. But here we go, Exa's going HQ to Axis. Again, I think running RD might be good. You want to force the Corp to spend money. Hit the Ichi. We're going to click through it, click through the trace specifically. Again, the other two subroutines don't matter and hit the IPO from HQ. Okay, I'm gonna take a little a stop here to talk about like how important the decisions you make in this game that might seem inconsequential have such a huge impact on this game. Remember at the beginning of the turn, play turn one, the Ichi went on HQ, right? It was possible to put the wall of static on HQ and so far for almost all of this game, uh, the wall of static, the corp couldn't, the runner couldn't get through. and. You know, right now where we are, it's running those HQ axes that Gabe is doing isn't that big of a deal. But just like the sort of butterfly effect that your decisions on turn one have for the whole game are monumentous. Now, putting the Ichi on HQ turn one against Gabe, I think, is a huge liability because you want to smash into that on click one because this is really bad in the early game without programs. Um, and it's also very expensive, but uh, it's, it's it's such a big deal to have the ice placement because it's going to generally matter, uh, you know, 12 turns from now. I should have marked where we are here. We'll, we'll figure out where we are. What turn was that? OK. So we're going to go through that. We're going to access and we see an IPO. No new information here. We knew that was there. We just spent two clicks to get two credits and an access. And again, the access is hoping we hit an agenda or any more information. And now we still have two clicks left and we're going to run R&D. And we'll see if the Victor res is here from Koran. This is actually pretty interesting because if they res the Victor, they're not going to be able to IPO at next turn. But this is an interesting res because if the Victor is res, the corp, uh, the, sorry, the runner only has one click left. So they can either decide to eat the brain damage and get through the end of the run. They could obviously dodge the brain damage and let the end of the run fire or let both fire and then have a click for Caddy Jones. I think the click for Caddy Jones seems really important right now. Uh, we'll see how much Koran values this, this protection. Um, this is gonna be interesting. So Koran actually is gonna res here, which again, I love this. This is such a big difference from allowing Koran not to res ice so that next turn they can IPO and they're at the point where Biotic Labor can score out agendas from hand, even double biotic if they kept it can score out from hand uh, pretty significantly. Uh, but now they're actually on lower credits. So next turn, it's going to be a bit worse for them. So again, you can click through this if you want. Let's see what they click through if they do. They're going to break the brain damage subroutine and they're going to let the end the run fire. So the question here is a brain damage worth three on Caddy Jones? Maybe. Honestly, maybe. Do they want to protect all these cards in hand? Maybe, because I think this is the last decoder. If they lose this decoder, they're going to be in an awkward situation. So maybe they want to avoid the brain damage, but that's going to be an end to run. And we're going to go no further than that. I've never seen HB doing brain damage like this, by the way. I expect this from Jinteki. Yeah, HB has most of the brain damage cards, but the fact that all this brain damage is connecting is largely to do with the fact that Exosol is running later in the turn than earlier. That's another thing we talked about, right? Like the idea of drawing and planning your turn and drawing later in the turn. Running early is good because you run early and then you see like, okay, that's a victor. And then you can have the rest of your turn to deal with the information you've gained from that run. Barring the buy right thing. That's also a really big deal. So we're going to discard one card here. I think you want to throw out the caddy. Um, so much brain damage. So we're going to discard the caddy, keep our breakers in hand. All right, Koran's going to start with three, drawn into an Adonis campaign. This is the first of this uh, pretty boy we've seen so far. This is the sort of card you want to brew if you get this early. There's a lot of money you get off of this. You do have to defend it, uh, which makes you spend a bit more money on it, which kind of counteracts how much money it's worth. Let's see what we do here. So install the Adonis campaign behind the Enigma. Install the Mason Bellamy, which honestly, I don't know if Mason Bellamy does anything. I guess it makes it harder to click through the Byroids, but uh, this has a lot more use outside of this uh, sort of limited format and clicking for a credit. So having four credits is a big deal because you can afford to res a Donis campaign. Uh, Exa, if they end up getting uh, and trashing the Donis campaign, it's going to be a problem for their economy. Last turn, they didn't click Caddy, which is a really big deal because this could be been nine. Um, so we see a runner at the top. Earthrise Hotel gets you HQ interface 
which is very expensive. And this is the first time that we've seen pressure on central servers. And again, we talked about how these decks aren't spending any influence, unfortunately. And again, spending influence is a really big deal. It allows you to deal and counteract some of the weaknesses of the factions you're playing because the factions, no faction is good at everything. Each faction is good at one or two things. And the ability to spend influence to, you know, rectify that and make your, widen your, your uh, lines of play. That's a really big deal. But central pressure is really, is really, really strong, right? Um, we also talked a bit about how generally in standard format, HQ runs from criminal are very, very impactful. Cards like a diversion of funds or the old account siphon are really easy to connect when you this ice generally doesn't do too much. And that can be a huge swing. But unfortunately, there's not a lot coming out of Gabe. I think the best we have in this deck is emergency shutdown, which actually could be incredibly impactful if that does connect. Anyways, we have HQ interface. Imagine we had a card like I don't, I don't know, medium is in the format right now or R&D interface and putting the pressure on R&D. Now the corp has to spend more time and more money and more ice protecting the central servers. Right now, the runner is only going for single accesses, which have about a 20% chance of those being okay on central servers. That math is, you know, ballpark enough. And we're putting it down. Wow, that's a lot of money. Now we're going to run HQ here. Probably going to end up clicking for, for through this. So we're going to get two credits and at least we're going to access two cards here, which is, uh, you know, a lot nicer. The question is, if there was an agenda in hand, would Korana put it on into the table behind two ice that the runner has no chance of dealing with? Almost definitely. So their chance of being an agenda in hand is actually super low. So this double access on the expensive HQ interface is probably not worth a lot. We do gain our two credits from Gabe. We hit an Eli from HQ and we hit an IPO, which is a card we already knew that was in there. And last click, not hitting the caddy again, which generally you want to hit every turn, especially when you don't have a lot of money to your name, and putting down the ferry. And we talked about this before, but putting down a program means that this ice that you need programs, that it's so much easier to deal with when you don't have programs, is a bit of a non-bow. You, you want to, if you're going to be tanking through that HE every turn, uh, you know, it's nice to not actually have any programs. All right, so we actually can't raise the Adonis here. If you don't want to raise the Adonis, I believe you're going to have, a, no, you will be a credit short of getting the IPO off. We're going to raise the Adonis, so the Adonis will pay back three credits, so you only spend one resing that, and we drew into another Ichi. Okay. So let's see what Koran does, wants to do here. They generally want to draw into an agenda. Their money is going to be pretty okay. If this Adonis ticks off next turn, they'll be at, like, what? four, five, six, seven, eight credits, uh, and then even more from that turn. So if they can draw into a 5-3 agenda right here and put it into uh, to server one, they're in a pretty good spot. So I'd actually consider drawing into an agenda uh, because Exol is not putting a lot of pressure on right now. So first, we're going to put an ice here on HQ and second draw again. We talked about this before. You want to change that ordering into what makes more sense. You could have drawn into a better ice for the situation, but Eli is pretty good. And then clicking for a credit here. You could consider putting the Adonis campaign in server one and having that tick for a couple turns, but I think Koran is going to be in a point where they'll draw an agenda relatively soon and then they want to put that into server one. Again, one in every five cards in the agenda and we've hit a bit of a drought here. So the, the amount of agendas in R&D is a bit higher than uh, what it normally is. Earth Ice Hotel finishes off. Ooh, sure gamble. That's the first one we've seen so far, right? And an Armitage. Both huge money cards that Exa could have drawn so much earlier in the game, which have been dope. Especially Armitage, because it's really good when you don't have a lot of credits. Let's see what we do here. Taking the money off Caddy. Again, this could have been 12 credits if you managed to hit this for the last two turns that we missed. Hitting the gamble, though. We're up at 12. That's the most credits Exa has. And we're going to make a run into HQ again. This can be such a big deal if this is a really big Byroid. I guess four credits, never mind. Uh, that's not worth saying. But again, not a lot of flexibility here if you want to click through things. And it's an Eli, which you can't click through because you just don't have enough clicks left. So that's going to hit and end the run subroutine. At least we're forcing the runner to spend money here. Oh, do you know the perfect play is right here? And this is why it's so good to make the corpse spend money. You could run a Donna's campaign here. There's no way they can resonate. Maybe if it's a hunter, that's okay. Let's see if they run. Yes, that's huge. This is exactly very good Netrunner play that you want to be doing. You can't let the Corp, the Corp can't do everything at once. So this is where you force them to spend money and then you fork, you you pivot over to a different server to take it down. Trashing this is going to cost the Corp nine credits and the Corp definitely needs our money right now. I love this play. This is fantastic. This is exactly what you want to be doing. And this is the sort of play that could have, the sort of play that was available to the runner since turn one. Run HQ, make them uncomfortable, and then attack their like their Maryland campaign or whatever. This is good. This is this is exactly what you want to be doing. 
Donna's campaign goes down for three credits. Exosol is still comfortably on nine. Uh, they do have an Armitage in their pocket. Let's see what they discard here. They're going to discard the Crypsis. It's a pretty expensive program, not only to install, but to use. Um, so uh, Exosol, nine credits. It's pretty good. Koran, on two. We also know there's two IPOs in hand. Those are going to be dead cards. Those have been in hand for so long. Honestly, it might have been okay that one turn not to res the victor, just so you can get these IPOs out, because uh, Koran is going to be struggling to get those credits together. New Adonis in server three. Again, you have to res that, but also you have to protect it if Exa just wants to first click run into this. We're going to do credit and credit. We're up at four. Okay, love it. This is such a good ch uh, ch change to see. X is saying, you know, I'm going to put pressure on you. Whatever you put into here, you're going to either have to spend money resing this, and if it's a buy road, I can click through it. We are going to res the Enigma. Now, this is the one punishment card for running early in the turn, but it's not too bad because Koran now only is on one credit, and they can't res this for the upcoming turn, so that's okay. Uh, X is going to lose a click on it. That's fine. Putting down the Armitage, and... Putting the money on Caddy. Wow. So the the click efficiency of Caddy Jones is actually a pretty buck wild. We've used Caddy a fair bit uh, throughout this game so far, so it gets a bit nicer. But you have to uh, like think about how soon are you going to need the money. If you're going to need the money really soon, Armitage a lot of times is better because by like for this to pay out well enough for the clicks you've spent on it, you generally want to have six to nine credits at this point, which will be in two to three turns. This actually might be nice that you get this down and then you can always put early, if I need money now, I'll hit Armitage and if I need money in the future, Caddy. Like that's kind of nice. I actually do like that a fair bit, but also putting down the Armitage and just taking money off the Armitage to ensure that you have money for the next turn immediately is pretty good. It's worth noting putting money on Caddy and then next turn taking money off of Caddy, you're spending two clicks to gain three credits, which is, Worse than Armitage. So if you want the money now, go Armitage. Maybe this is really nice that they're diversifying. All right. Can't afford the Donis campaign. We drew into a wall of static, which is actually one of the best pieces of advice in the deck right now because you can't click through with Byroid with no Byroid text. And the Demara is four credits to install and four credits to break this, which is absolutely awful. And that's also a very big thing when it comes to spending influence in decks. Criminals are really, really bad at dealing with barriers and kind of bad at dealing with code gates. They're very good at dealing with sentries, but a lot of times you'll see criminals spending influence to get a better fractor into their deck. Because the fact that it costs four credits plus another four credits to deal with a single wall of static is so painful. So we're going to click for credit, and again, they need the money. They want to be on at least four credits to be able to res this on the following turn. So credit, credit, into biotic labor, into credit, credit. Oh, wow, that's wild. Okay, so if you notice, they ended their turn with two credits. And they began their turn with two credits, if I'm not mistaken. So that whole turn of clicking for credits and spending a really strong card just to click for more credits, it was actually incredibly credit negative, and it put them further behind. Um, that is something you want to avoid doing. Not only is Biotic Labor a very strong card to be able to score agendas from hand, sometimes you'll see it being used just to get another click on a turn to install like a defensive upgrade on top of an agenda. There are some flexibilities where runners, or sorry, corpse will use this to advance their game plan. A lot of times it's just for scoring agendas from hand. But using this just to click for credits is actually very credit negative, right? They started their turn and ended their turn on the same amount of credits. So you want to kind of pay attention to, um, to that sort of... Uh, Value four for an extra click that you're spending just to click for credit. That's going to be pretty rough for you. That's actually a really big deal. That makes X, and it's like you can't spend a turn doing that. Hopefully, that's obvious because Exa now has so much breathing room, right? Like Koran basically skipped their whole turn and spent a very powerful resource that Criminal struggles to deal with. All right. I don't know, need something interesting to do. <laughs> Clicking for credits is way, way better for that than that for sure. You also could have put the ash into this remote server. You're also now so much further behind from IPO, but yeah, that's that's definitely incredibly credit negative. <laughs> Lol. All right, Caddy Jones taking three off of it, and we talked about that before. I like this kind of play because it gives you late game, like later money and earlier money off the Armitage, but spending two clicks to gain three credits is not great compared to Armitage where you could have spent two clicks to get four, and then this only gets better the longer you leave the money on it. We're now running into this. We still have two clicks left. So if it's a Byroid, it's okay. And we're finally taking down the pad campaign. Honestly, at this point, I wouldn't say Exa has enough money where they can cont consider contesting this pad campaign. Obviously, Koran's money is not good right now. So getting that free credit a turn is a really big deal. But I think Exasol still needs to put down breakers. Uh, so they still have a lot of work to do, especially when they know that they can't deal with the wall static without spending at least a minimum of eight credits. But we are going to get in here. 
The pad campaign is going to come down. We're also going to see what this upgrade is, which unfortunately this ash would be so much better in server one, but we do have another one. Going to take that down for four, going to access the ash. You don't want to trash that and putting down a breaker. Okay, so a couple things. Firstly, I do like that Exa is now paying attention to economy and contesting the things. That's a really big deal why making them spend money on their ice is really important because then you can swing over and then take apart these things. And Koran's money is in a really bad spot. Now, uh, the next thing that comes down here is installing the breaker. I'm not a big fan of this, uh, this sort of play, because this shows, this like broadcasts to the corp, by the way, I have this. And now the sort of play is like, okay, I feel pretty good jamming it behind an enigma or something like that. I'm not saying that's a good play, but it, it gives so much information to the corporation that you're capable of doing something or what you're not capable of doing. Uh, so let's see if they use this this turn, because then that looks a bit better. And they're using it actually. Okay, so that looks a lot better. And running glass click into enigma is fantastic uh, because you can spend uh, you can you, you don't have to um, break both of these subroutines because you can't lose a click of Fable. So we're going to spend one, just break it and the run, fantastic. And we're going to access this card with two credits. So now big question is, what is this card, right? Like, so you have to assume, the assumption is, is it an agenda or is it not an agenda? If it is an agenda, I would assume that agenda would have gone into server one. So this is likely not an agenda, right? Because if Koran had an agenda, it would probably go in server one behind two maybe three pieces of ice. So this is more likely to be something like a pad campaign or Adonis. And right now they don't have the credits to trash either any of these. They also don't have a bank job, which would have been sick here instead, but we're just gonna access this, get some information that's an Adonis campaign and not be able to trash it, which is a bummer because we spent four credits to put on the egg nail a click and a run, which is a fair bit of money when you could be like mashing Armitage or drawing into like inside jobs or any of the other cards you have in your deck. So this is very unlikely to be an agenda. Uh, and it doesn't pay off. All right, corp drawing. There's a pad campaign. Gonna put that again back on top of the ash, which is fine. You do have another ash here and credit, credit. That's again what Koran wanted to do last turn. And if they did do that last turn, I think they would have been able to IPO if they didn't do the biotic thing, which is such a big difference because now Koran can just jam any agenda behind the stuff. Runner, drawing in. Okay, we got another Armitage drawing into legwork. A pretty good card. You might not need it on top of the HQ interface. You can't really deal with this too well, especially now that we've installed more programs. So now the Ichi is really important to be able to deal with. Uh, and again, if a Koran had an agenda, it probably would be in server one. It probably wouldn't be hanging out in hand. So this legwork isn't going to do too much right now. Hitting up Caddy, probably taking money off of Armitage. Love that. Want to use Caddy a turn if you need her. And at this point, if like if if Exa can just put enough, get enough money and install both of their breakers, we're playing good old Honest Netrunner, which is just breakers, ice, and having enough money. And honestly, Exa is set up to do that with a Caddy every turn with Armitage right now. Uh, they might be okay. So just getting to that spot means Exa is, is set up and, and Koran really has to start doing some interesting plays. Resing the Adonis here. So that's going to cost them one credit. So they could have been at four. Well, okay, so they're not going to IPO at anyways here. Ooh, Maryland's nice. Credit, credit, credit. I think you could consider putting the Maryland campaign in server one, let it tick out for a couple turns, and then eventually you can overinstall if you want to. And we're going to discard an Ash. Ash is one of the best cards in this whole system, what is it called, system core, for protecting agendas in remote servers. If you have more money, and again, you already start with this four credit boost of the trace, they could end up running this whole server and then hitting this trace and not being able to boost it and scoring an agenda out. Now, Ish Ash is a unique card, but uniqueness only cares if the card is res. So if Koran thinks I have an Ash in this remote, I don't want an Ash in server one, you can put an Ash in server one as well. And just, you only have one res at a time. So I think putting the Ash in this remote is a really big deal because at that point, Exa has to be able to run this, which is already pretty difficult, and then beat the Ash trace or run this again, which again, wall static is going to cost them four credits a pop already. So that's really good. I think this is such a big deal. If they have the Ash in server one, they're feeling pretty good on, on uh, just just jamming a 5-3 agenda in here, let alone Mesa Bellamy on top of Ash. Fantastic, because it's very hard to run the remote twice in a turn. They tell me there are agendas in this game, and that's actually a really big deal. Koran could spend clicks just to draw, just to jam agendas in here. Their economy is almost at the point to support that, but yeah, clicking to draw is a really good action, um, especially if you know I can score out right now. Now, that being said, there's probably like, what, nine agendas in the whole deck? That's a one in two on R&D. And Exa probably should see this. Like, Koran maybe has an agenda in hand. Maybe they don't feel great about the server, but the server looks good. But running R&D looks really good right now. Because again, oh, not nine and 18, but like like maybe six and 18. So one and three. That's, really, that's pretty good. 
That's pretty good. Even this very deck. All right. Putting one in caddy again, doing that first click, you, it doesn't really change much of your turn, so you might as well do that last click. It also gives you more clicks to run and face check into to buy rights on accident. Hitting up the Armitage, hitting up the Armitage, and last click running the Enigma. It looks like Exa really wants to spend the four credits to break the Enigma and trash the Donna's campaign. I like that. Unfortunately, Koran will be able to IPO at next turn, so their money problems are going to be solved for a minute, but uh, it's good to keep the pressure on here because I thought they know they have IPO. I don't know. Maybe. Still, nine credits is a heck of a lot. All right, that comes down. And Axis still is building up money, which is fantastic. All right, Koran has the chance here to do credit, credit IPO. It looks like we're going to just put another Adonis in and credit, credit. So we're set up for the IPO next turn. This is nice too because Exa looks like they're checking this and it forces them to check. This is very likely to be a Maryland. This is probably not an agenda considering server one is where they would go if they have them. Exa drawing a card, there's the bank job. And again, such a big deal here. You can break this for one last click and then take eight off a of bank job. This card is worth playing around in this format. Putting the bank job down, hitting caddy for three, running the remote, spending one to break the single subroutine that matters with Abignail. All the cash and nothing to steal with. We're going to go through here. Now, it's important to know if you use bank job, you can't access the card. It replaces the access step or maybe at the point you're watching this, the breach step, sort of. Uh, so let's see. We're going to get the bank job and we're going to take the money off of it. Again, such a big card in this format. That's a huge amount of money. Now, resing the Adonis campaign, it means that you're going to be down one credit this turn by the start of your, your turn, because this will pay off. Also, resing the pad campaign. This puts them on six, so they can still do credit, credit IPO. But man, the agendas are all in R&D. This gives Exa so much breathing time, which is really good. And let's see if Exa understands that they're in R&D and whether they pivot there. My breakers are terrible. That is very true. And that's why you generally end up spending influence in, in criminal to, to fix your breaker problem. Credit, credit, finally IPO. It's been in hand for, I think, about 10 turns. It's good to get that on. Koran's economy is good. I don't know whether you need to deal with this Adonis campaign because if Koran has an agenda, it goes into server one, and that is a bigger threat to deal with than this Adonis right now. We'll see what the runner does here. Caddy Jones, there's a Damara. We have all the breakers. X on 15. And we're going for the legwork. Okay, so it's good to keep the pressure on. I would argue, though, that at this point, if Koran had an agenda, it would probably go in server one. So this does see four cards and gives you the game value, which is okay. But unfortunately, just the timing of this isn't going to line up too well. So, hey, Eli for four, that is incredible. Wait, what? For six? Jesus. Okay, you spending six credits on Eli is a lot. It is a heck of a lot. And that is kind of the thing with, with Byroids is that while they are generally pretty efficient for as low as they cost, they don't they don't cost a lot. They have a lot of strength, is that you have the flexibility. I think if Exa maybe waited a turn, you probably want to click through this instead of paying six, because each click you spend on there is basically like gaining three credits. And that flexibility is a really big deal for you. Um Hitting the Ichi, you do have the Fairy, which is the cheapest way in the deck to deal with it largely. And we're going to spend that Fairy, which is now a resource you don't have, uh, obviously in the future. And we're going to gain our Gabe two credits, acts as a Maryland campaign. Don't think you... Oh, we're trashing it? For three, hitting the IPO and an Ichi and a Hunter. So we know there's an Ichi in hand. We know there's a Hunter. And X has one click left. See what they do here. Oh, they say gross. <laughs> Run HQ all you want. And they're drawing into a sure gamble. So how much money did they spend that turn? Let's see. So they started on 19. And unfortunately, now they're down to three and they don't have anything to show for it. And I, I think that makes sense, right? Like if there's an agenda here, I feel like Koran would probably put it behind three pieces of ice on top of what looks like a defensive upgrade uh, as opposed to keeping it into hand. So I feel like the HQ pressure is, is probably just is not a great time to line up here. And I think the top of R&D has, again, what we said, like a, a, a six and 16 chance of being an agenda, which, you know, it's pretty good. Let's see if it is an agenda. Okay, blue level clearance. We're going to open with blue level clearance. Jesus, what's an R&D here? That draws two cards for two clicks and gains you, I think, three credits. Drawing it to an Eli, which again, we've seen cost six credits for exit to break and a Maryland campaign. And we're IPOing out. Excuse me. So we're up on 25 credits. So Koran now has a ridiculous amount of credits. They probably can res every single ice for the rest of the game, advance out every agenda. So at this point, you don't really need to contest the Adonis or the Bad campaign. The money is set.
Now we did talk about how good this ash is. If you have a credit lead and you have an ash in a remote server, you're basically saying Exa, you're going to have to run this twice. This card is so powerful if you put it into server one. Unfortunately, we don't have it anymore, but it's so good to score behind. What even is this ice? Oh, it's a Turing. That's eh, it's not too bad either. All right, so runner needs to recover their economy. They have the Adonis, they have, or sorry, not the Adonis, they have the Caddy, they have the Armitage. Hitting up Armitage, playing the Sure Gamble, they're up on nine, and now we're running R&D here. Again, we don't have many clicks left, so if there is a big buy road here, it's gonna be an issue. The Victor one, you can always click through <laughs> the end of the run and take the brain damage, otherwise we're spending what? Ooh, four credits, that's so expensive. These breakers are awful. Um, And hitting the wall static, this is four credits to go through. Spending eight credits for a single axis feels really bad. And again, we've talked about this before. Influence should be spent to make this run on R&D a bit more impactful with things like Maker's Eye or probably playing just better breakers. Hit R&D, paper trail off the top. And again, I don't think that's super unlikely. There's probably, uh, what, four to five more agendas and 12 cards. And Exosol is now on game point. There are three point agendas in this deck and now Exosol does have a good chance of winning. You can always run through this. And that's the scary thing about criminals is that imagine they had a maker's eye or something uh, that sees more cards in R&D, makes our run a bit more impactful. They could always run R&D on a panic and bypass the breaker, uh, bypass the code gate, by using Abagnail or click through it and then bypass the wall static by using the Damara. And it's really hard to defend against that. Last click, <laughs> knew it, found one. Uh, they're gonna hit the Caddy Jones up. All right, now if Corona, uh, if Koran draws into a 5-3, oh man, they're off to the races. Again, also like that whole line of play of bypassing does make it scary for Koran. So maybe they wanna play a bit defensively on this remote server. Maybe if they had an agenda, they don't feel amazing here. But again, that's why Ash comes in, right? Cause if they end up using both of their breakers just to like bypass through these, then the Ash trace fires and then they have to run back, which is gonna be a problem. Using the blue level clearance to draw, oh my God, R&D is loaded. Drawing into two hedge funds, I don't think you play these hedge funds. I think you put another piece of ice somewhere. You don't need the money. You don't need 34 credits, let alone with a Donis campaign and pad campaign. And there you go, another install. The Hunter, mind you, don't love this because I feel like Exosol can just take the tag on the turn that they're going to win or lose the game and it doesn't matter. I would like an actual end to run, I think, here. Ichi on the outside is pretty rude too. Uh, but not the most important because you can click through it. I feel like the wall static is just so strong because it costs them four to deal with. And we're going to throw out some cards. Throwing out the wall static again, I think that's a very, very good piece of ice because uh, they can't click through it and you don't need these hedge funds. All right, drawing up. Woo! We haven't, it's been a while since we've seen Sneak Door, but again, I think if Koran drew a nice, it would go straight into server one, or sorry, an agenda, it would go straight into server one. Drawing into networking, uh, it's not going to do really anything in this matchup. And a dirty laundry and probably hitting up Caddy here. Again, you need to keep money because now that you don't end your turn with a lot of money, Koran can feel pretty good about just jamming in server, server one. You need to make sure that you always are a threat. Gonna have to discard a card, getting rid of the networking, seems correct. And we drew into a 4-2 agenda. Fire truck. Okay, so this 4-2 agenda is a bummer. Because if Koran wants to score this out, they're going to have be at six points and they're still going to have to score another agenda. Drawing into the priority requisition, which is the 5-3 in this deck, would be ideal here. But I think Koran just needs to score this out anyways. Again, Biotic Labor, nice to have in hand, allows a lot of these plays to be a lot easier. So we're going to install this. I read the lead designer in East Days called with like games were to take about 15 minutes. Yo, admittedly, I'm excited about that, but that's a big part of this game is that none of the, this deck doesn't have like explosive uh, power turns. It has a really slow economy. And the, the more cards you put into your deck to make yourself more click efficient, to make your runs matter more than single axes, the shorter games will likely be. Cards like Diversion of Funds, Turn 1 through the Ichi 1.0 is gonna absolutely put Koran on the back foot. And cards like that will close games faster. All right. Successful field test in the remote, and we're doing advance, advance. Which, honestly, advance, advance is, is pretty wild. Because now this, I like this play. While you don't need to advance, advance this agenda to be able to score it out next turn, it means Exosol has to respect this to be a 5-3 agenda, and might have to go for a Hail Mary turn this turn, because they assume they're going to lose on the following turn. That might work out for Koran. It might mean Exosol is just going to go run R&D and bypass this and bypass this, and have a chance of stealing a real 5-3. We'll see how this plays out. Okay, taking the six off Caddy, just smashing in th into this. We have an Enigma on the outside. You can get through this for two credits. You can even get through this for one credit if you want to uh, lose the click. 
We pay two. We hit the victor. This is four credits to break. And if you spend that, you can't deal with the wall aesthetic without bypassing it. Resing the Mason Bellamy as well. Again, Koran's money doesn't matter. So no matter what, you're going to be losing clicks on this. It doesn't really matter too much. And wait, how does this work? Whenever encounter with piece of ice ends. Okay, so it's not like you can spend a click and then you'll lose a click that you can't spend on the next subroutine. And we are clicking through it which basically means those clicks are worth two credits because it's four credits to break this thing. I'd argue that you could take the brain damage and save, uh, it does, it does, yeah, it saves a credit. Actually, that's not amazing. It saves a click though, that's a bit better. Uh, I guess the four credit math on this is a bit off, but whatever. Uh, the wall of static, we're hitting into this, so we can pay four, or we could bypass it. We also now know, and I think that resing the Mason Bellamy here might be incorrect because the runner could have considered this to be an Ash. And now they know that this isn't an Ash, and Ash means that this run is actually useless. Now they know it's not an Ash, so they know if they do get through this uh, wall of static, there's no more tricks. If this was an Ash, they might consider to be like, okay, well, if I get through this, well, I guess that, that does. For what it's worth, at that point, if they thought this was an Ash, they shouldn't have ran. And now that they know it's not an Ash, it doesn't change too much because they already committed to the run. But knowing that this isn't an Ash means that they have full information that they can bypass or break this wall of static and likely steal an agenda. There's a chance this is an aggressive secretary, but yeah. Let's see what they do. They're actually going to bypass it. That's a really big deal. That is the second Damara. So now Koran knows for the next turn that they can jam behind the wall static if they have an agenda. But I think the biggest deal here is that Exasol thinks this is a 5-3 agenda. I like this play. I like the double advance to make sure Exasol goes for that Hail Mary. They're going to find out that it's only a two-point agenda, putting Exasol on six, which means both players are still on game point. Mason Bellamy. I don't think you want to trash it. And that is Exosol's turn because they lost additional clicks to Mason. They click through the buy road, right? Yeah, fantastic. All right. Rota turret. Honestly, looking right nice here. If there was a Rota turret on the outside, that would have connected. Uh, and that would have been disastrous. But Koran needs to find that agenda. Hopefully a 5-3. <laughs> that was costly. It's very correct. I think Koran just wants to draw here. There's the 5-3 agenda. So again, install advance on priority requisition is a big deal if you had biotic labor in hand because following turn you could do biotic labor, advance, 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 and score it out. And I think this card is probably a bit safer in this remote server. So we're gonna put another piece of ice on here. Koran can afford that and go ahead and put the priority requisition. So it looks like Koran won't be able to score this out for the next two turns, but they understand how they can win. Exosol doesn't have a way to get to the wall of static, needs to find a uh, Fractor before they can do anything else. So that's really all they can do here. They could always smash into HQ, click through the Eli, click through the Ichi, or let it fire. But at this point, again, if Korn had an agenda, it goes into server one. Sneak Door Beta coming down. Again, the axes on HQ probably aren't worth it right now, considering they do have a place to put agendas. And we're going to run right into a Rota turret. This has been here for a while. Uh, you can choose a program to trash. I think you go for the Abignail. Trashing the Abignail so Exosol has no breakers whatsoever. Just drawing into something, hitting up the Caddy Jones, and it looks like this is going to close out relatively quickly. We're going to get advance, advance. A third advance here doesn't really matter because you're going to win next turn largely regardless. You actually could spend this click just to put another piece of ice somewhere and play it really safe. Um, but it looks like we're going to go for the three advance. And here the runner's got nothing really to do. About to deck out is true. Running HQ, this is the best they got here, hoping that they top decked an agenda and couldn't jam it anywhere, uh, which is honestly really good. X is all, that's a really good play here because that's the only way you're gonna win. We know we can't get through the wall of static. We know we can't get through the road turret. We know we can't get through this wall of static. So you might as well go HQ and give yourself a shot. Uh, I guess if Koran did draw an agenda, they could have discarded it into archives and hope there's no fairy or inside job there, but at least this is uh, getting an access, which is fantastic. And last click, you can let all of these things fire. They don't matter. We're going to get double access too. Again, we do have an HQ interface. Going to get our two credits. Hitting a Heimdall and a hedge fund. And that is going to be advance, advance for the Corb. Finally taken out. It took 25 turns. Which again, playing with this, uh, the, the power level of these cards, not spending influence, having some issues with economy for a large stretch of turn. That biotic labor play actually was incredibly detrimental to Koran. Uh, the games go faster. They, they do go faster. Uh, if, if you can uh, iron out some of the weaknesses of the deck. And Exa honestly could have closed that out. I think they could have, if you look at this deck, I think there's going to be like, what, three agendas and four cards, three or two. Oh, it's just one. Oh yeah, because three-point agendas, there's only one three-point agenda. I didn't even realize that. 
Hey, sorry, I just realized this in, in retrospect, so I need to pop back on to say this. Uh, this is the 5-3 that was just scored to win the game. And if you look at the number of agenda points in the deck, this is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. This list only has 15 points worth of agendas in the, in the deck itself. Uh, for a 45 to 49 card deck, you're required to have 20 to 21 agenda points in your deck itself. So uh, the, the Corp is actually playing with two fewer agendas in the deck than what is uh, legally expected in standard format Netrunner. Um, I just want to make sure. So they're a 49 card deck. Yeah. Uh, 40. Yeah. So they're actually five agenda points, uh, fewer. And that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of turns where you expected the, the runner, the corp to draw into agenda that they didn't. And there's a lot of frustration about that at points in the game and that the pressure from X's whole single axis were actually a fair bit worse than they might've looked. So that's a really big deal. Those are also card slots. So Corrin has to drop two cards from their deck and add generally two more agendas to their deck, sometimes even three agendas if you don't want to play three pointers. So that's actually a really big deal. And that makes a lot of sense in retrospect because those single axes uh, were not great and the agendas were really, really, really few and far between. So do pay attention to that. That's going to have a huge impact on your game. You want to play 20 to 21 agenda points for a card uh, for a deck that's 40, uh, 45 to 49 cards. Most people play 49 card decks that have 20 agenda points into them. If you're playing 40 to 44 card decks, some cards have a smaller minimum deck size. You can get away with 18 to 19 agendas. You can find all these rules on uh, nisei.net and NetrunnerDB uh, will actually help you in deck building. They'll tell you if you have too few agendas. So do watch out for that. That does make a lot of sense in retrospect. Let's look really quickly at the runner side. What else do they have left in their deck? Like inside jobs would be good. They did have the um, fairies, I guess. The networkings are dead. Another caddy. There's actually not that much they want to draw into their deck. Uh, I think they definitely want to get a breaker and the fracture at the bottom is a problem. Okay. I think there's a lot to learn to the game. I think there's certain points in the replay that you can pin out things that have a huge impact on the game. I think one of the first things, how, how do I go to the front? I guess I just slide this. It's just like ice placement is really important. I think if on click one, turn one, the runner pressured the Ichi, uh, it's such a different game, right? Like Koran can't afford to res this. If they do res this for some reason, it's not a very good ice at this point. And then you can start taking down the Maryland campaign. Koran's going to have to click for credits. It's so wildly different. Going down to so few credits also early in the game, where like there's nothing you can do with the cards you draw. Also, such a really it's such a big deal where Koran can feel very safe. There was like this really clear turn at some point around turn 17 or 18 where X's play. I'm a really I start to be a really big fan of where they start poking and forcing those reses and then trashing and pressuring the economy. If you play like that since turn one, it's such a wildly different game. And I think that's fantastic. You can't just sit back and be like, and, and, and you saw that, right? Like with the early special order, you can't you really shouldn't be sitting back to be like, OK, I'm going to pull my breakers. I'm going to play it safe. This is the part of the game where you just force the corp to do things. You force the pressure out and putting down your programs is, is going to be a bit too expensive, especially when the programs are this bad. Also, spend influence, which obviously you can do. Uh, if you want to see some system core deck lists, uh, Devetus, you can find these on Netrunner D to be published these. And these probably, you see the difference. You have a better fractor already. You have um, multi-axis on R&D with cards like Maker's Eye. Like this is such a big change. On the corp side too, you have cards like Tollbooth and Pop-Up Window. You have Red Herrings, another defensive upgrade. Uh, you have a bit more money too with cards like Beanstalk Royalties, which can be pretty nice. All in all, though, like you, you can see some easy ways that both of these players can improve their, their play. You know, uh, forcing pressure on the corp is good. Running early click, not having the Ichi hit you is also a really big deal. Uh, planning your turn out so you're not drawing last click. All these things matter. And also, you don't want a biotic for credits. Um, that's going to put you very far behind. Anywho, huge shout outs to Exo and for Koran for submitting this deck list so we can go over it. Hopefully there's a lot to learn. I'd be love to, I'd love to hear anybody's feedback on this. I'm really interested to do more of this when we get the new system gateway. I also have some other replays I need to go through for sure. But hopefully there's a lot to learn from that. There's some very basic fundamentals here that will resonate uh, through any game you play, regardless of the, of the the cards you're playing with. And the fact that HB has biroids is going to be relevant for probably the rest of the time. So runner first click at all. Put pressure on the core. Good stuff to do. Anywho, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll be back soon. Streaming on Thursdays, mind you, at 8.45 Eastern. And otherwise, we'll hopefully get some videos up on this channel soon enough. Ciao.